Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Gilbert. On behalf of the Contra Costa County Library, the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters West Contra Costa County, and Contra Costa County TV, welcome to our webinar, Roadmap to Voting 2022. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly review a few housekeeping items. This is a Zoom webinar. And I'd like to um, remind you that audience microphones and your videos are turned off. Any questions you have for the panelists, please submit them by using the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be shared with the moderator and panelists during the Q&A portion of the presentation. The webinar is being recorded and at the end of the program, it will be posted on the YouTube channels of the Contra Costa County Library and the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley. Site addresses for those YouTube channels will be displayed on screen at the end of the program. The contact information for each panelist will also be posted on the screen. Additionally, Contra Costa Television will be broadcasting the program live today the, and rebroadcasting later and the dates and times will be posted on your screen at the end of the webinar. Contra Costa Television is available to watch on Comcast Channel 27, AT&T UVerse Channel 99, Astound Channel 32, and online at ContraCostaTV.org. The League of Women Voters of the United States believes that voting is a fundamental citizen's right that must be guaranteed. Before introducing our moderator, I am pleased to introduce Ms. Pamela Perales, who is our Spanish interpreter. This is the first of our community conversation programs to be simultaneously interpreted. We sincerely thank the Contra Costa Library for providing this valuable service to our community. Now, I would like to introduce Ms. Pamela Perales. Buenas noches y bienvenidos al webinar de esta noche. Eh, estamos, antes de comenzar, quiero hacer unos comentarios. Eh, primero, eh, ustedes están participando en un webinar de Zoom, así que sus micrófonos y videos van a estar apagados. Si tiene alguna pregunta, por favor, escríbala en la casilla de mensajes en la parte inferior de su, de su pantalla. Eh, estas preguntas van a ser compartidas con los moderado, moderadores y los panelistas al final en la sección de preguntas y respuestas. Esta reunión va a ser grabada y al haber terminado la vamos a poner en el canal de YouTube de eh, las bibliotecas del condado de Contracosta y en, en la página de eh, la Liga de Mujeres Votantes de Diablo Valley. Eh, al final de esta reunión nosotros vamos a poner la información de contacto de los panelistas eh, y esto, eh, este webinar también se va a poder ver en vivo eh, a través de eh, el, la televisión de Contracosta y también lo puede ver después. Eh, Usted puede ver eh, la, te, la televisión de, el canal de televisión de Contracosta si tiene Comcast en el canal 27, eh, si tiene AT&T en el canal 99 eh, o también lo puede buscar en línea. Eh, queremos eh, notar que el derecho a votar es un derecho fundamental de todos los ciudadanos y tiene que ser garantizado. Antes de presentar a la moderadora, queremos presentar a nuestro intérprete y agradecer a la, eh, las bibliotecas de Contracosta, porque este es el primer evento en el que tenemos un intérprete que va a interpretar simultáneamente. Así que muchas gracias por proveer esos servicios. Vamos a presentar a nuestro intérprete Pamela para que eh, pueda indicar cómo participar en español. Buenas tardes a todos. El día de hoy se van a proveer los servicios de interpretación al español. Para poder participar en español, en unos momentos usted va a ver en la parte inferior de su pantalla el icono de un globo terráqueo. O si está usando un teléfono celular, va a aparecer el icono de tres puntos suspensivos. Al darle clic a cualquiera de estos eh, iconos, usted va a poder seleccionar su idioma de preferencia. 
queremos notar que todavía no va a aparecer, ya que no he sido asignada como intérprete, pero en unos momentos, en cuanto lo haya sido, usted va a poder verlos y seleccionar. Albert, please sign me as an interpreter. One other item I would like to um, mention is at the end of the webinar, we will be posting a resource list that has valuable, important links that voters can go to to find information on much of what you're hearing today. Now, it is, my, um, it is with my great pleasure to introduce you to our mo today's moderator, Martha Garalka. <laughs> Excuse me. Martha has been a member of the League of Women Voters for more than 50 years in Minnesota, Maine, and Iowa before moving to California in 1981. She has worked with voter services projects in every state she has called home. Currently, she is co-chair of voter services for the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley during her final year as a board member. Martha has had a varied career working for Minnesota Star and Tribune in the News Research Department, WXKA AM and FM Radio as an owner operator, WMT stations and Cedar Rapids Clinic for Women. In California, Martha worked for the Contra Costa newspapers, Antioch Chamber of Commerce, and her retirement job is with East County's Delta Learning Center, which turned into a volunteer position after her 2020 final retirement. Martha serves on several boards in East County and has held positions of leadership for the past 30 years. Honors include Woman of the Year in 1980, awarded by the Women's Equality Day Committee to Lynn County, Iowa, Women Demonstrating Leadership in 2020, awarded by the Contra Costa Commission for Women and Girls, and a Woman of Achievement in 2020, awarded by Seroptus excuse me, Sir Optimus International of Antioch. Martha lives in Antioch, California. Welcome, Martha. Well, thank you so much. Again, welcome to your Roadmap to Voting 2022, a deep look at all aspects of voting. We'll be hearing from our Contra Costa Elections Department, from our Voters Edge League of Women Voters County Coordinator, and from a local elected official who will remind us why voting is so important, especially in those down ballot contests, which affect us all personally on a local level. Our first panelists are County Clerk Recorder, Debbie Cooper, and Tommy Gong, Deputy County Clerk Recorder. They will give us an inside look into the elections department and how they keep our votes secure. Debbie Cooper was sworn in on February 4th 2020 as County Clerk Recorder, the Board of Supervisors conducted an in-depth and open process to fill the position, and Ms. Cooper was selected from a group of 22 applicants to complete the term vacated by Joe Canciamella. Debbie is no stranger to the Clerk Recorder Elections Department. Debbie has worked for the Department's Administrative Division for more than 32 years she served as the Deputy County Clerk Recorder since 2012, acting as a County Clerk Recorder when called upon. She will hold the County Clerk Recorder and register our voters position through early 2023, the end of the current elected term. She is passionate about working for the county and providing critical services to their elected, to their constituents. Debbie has more than 35 years of experience in business administration, finance, and management, both in the private sector and public service. In addition to a BS degree in business administration and interior design from CSU Chico, she holds the National Election Center certification as a certified elections and registration administrator. She is a California professional elections administrator, as well as a a uh, certified county executive and a CSAC Institute fellow. Wow, Tommy Gong joined the Contra Costa County Clerk Recorder Registrar Department as its Deputy County Clerk Recorder in July, 2021, when the recent governor recall election was called for by the state legislature. 
As an election administrator, Tommy's first election was the previous governor recall election in 2003. At that time, he caught the election bug and has been involved with elections for more than 19 years. Tommy first served as elections manager in Stanislaus County in 2003. In 2005, he was hired as assistant county clerk recorder in San Luis Obispo and elected as county clerk recorder in 2014. He earned his bachelor's degree at the University of California at Berkeley and a master's of business administration at San Francisco State University and was among the first in the state to complete the California Professional Election Administrator credential in 2005 and recently completed the National Certified Election Registration Administrator credential this summer. Debbie and Tommy, we're ready for you to start. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us here today. Um, I believe you're going to bring up a PowerPoint that we have to share some information with you, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have after. So there, if we could make that full screen, that would be great. Wonderful. So um, we're going to talk about um, three general areas, the 2022 elections, both the June and the November election, and then some information about election safety and security, and then a little bit about um, our internal outreach and education. So if we could switch to the next screen, there we go. <clears throat> so the 2022 elections, in general, November is going to look very much like um, June did. Uh, we had 37 drop boxes. Uh, we had five early voting locations, 152 polling places, um, and we're now central counting our ballots. Now, the picture of that giant red box is because our, our drop boxes have been so popular that we've had to expand the program. And that's a picture from actually a, a catalog for purchasing them, but we're buying one that's that big that will look like the white ones that you your folks are used to seeing. And we're putting it at the Danville Park and Ride because that is our biggest, most popular Dropbox uh, location. And that will assure that we don't run out of room because um, our voters really like these drop boxes. And then we'll the one that's there will be moving over to Concord City Hall, which is our second most um, frequented drop box. So um, the early voting locations open four days as before, Friday, Saturday, Monday, um, and election day. And then um, we'll talk a little bit more about moving back to central count, but instead of voters feeding their ballots into a tabulator at the voting precinct, they are now being transported back to our main office. It, um, it, it allows for us to have better control over the process. All the ballots are being counted in our office where our systems and our equipment have been secured. And um, anyway, on to the next slide, please. So these are just some statistics that you may be interested in. Voter registration for June was 706,000. And it, it looks like we've reduced our, our voter roll down to 696,000. But in reality, what we've been doing is cleaning it up. We've been working very hard to make sure that we take duplicate um, voter registrations out of there and people that have moved. Um, we're able to use a statewide voter registration database which is, is helping us do that a lot. So um, as, our, as our roles look like they're coming down, it means that they're more accurate. We um, are very happy with that. So October 24th is the last day to register to vote for the November election. That's the last 15 days before the election. And that is the day um, for you to get a regular vote by mail in, in the mail, just like all the rest of the voters. After October 24th, you still can register to vote. Um, through the conditional voter registration process, but you'll have to vote in person. So you'll have to go to one of our early voting sites or to um, our one of our polling places or our office. Um, and then you'll see those are the, the same. We do project that, the, okay, so the turnout in June was fairly abysmal, it's 35%. Um, that's not out of the ordinary for a primary for the gubernatorial races. I, I think four years ago it was 37%. Um, we do expect turnout to probably double for November. There are some, um, some races on the ballot too that, that may bring the vote out more too. Um, our ballots will be going out beginning September 29th. I'm sorry, our voter information guides will be going out beginning September 29th 
Um, those are in the final state stages of being proofed right now, and our ballots will be going out on October 10th. Um, I do want to say that um, October 10th is a post office holiday. We're open here, but they don't deliver mail on that day. However, the postal facility, their, um, their main office in Oakland is still doing processing. So they'll be processing our ballots overnight that night, and they should start arriving in folks' mailboxes on Tuesday, October 11th. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is just a picture of where our drop boxes are located and we try to put them near um, transportation hubs and places where it's easy for for people to get to them uh, next slide so um, i'm going to talk just a tiny bit about safety and security and then i'm going to show you a poster that shows all the things we've been working on but we take safety and security of the election process very seriously um, elections are designated as critical infrastructure by Homeland Security. And as such, we have support of some of the national and statewide agencies, and we work with them to assure that our networks and our equipment and our people and our processes are all as secure as possible. So um, we've worked with the federal CISA, which is a cybersecurity infrastructure security agency. It's a mouthful, that's why we call it CISA. And uh, they've worked with us a lot on on and they work with agencies across the country on security planning and safeguards and things like that so we also just recently added a dedicated position to our it staff whose primary job is to oversee cyber security and network security so next slide so there's a lot of writing here and i'm not going to go through this but hopefully this will either get posted in the chat somehow or get posted um, on the League of Women Voters website so that you can refer to it. And this is a document that we work with CISA to define the election security safeguards that we use here in Contra Costa County to make sure that everything is safe and secure. And so just a couple of the things to highlight are that our networks, our counting systems are not connected to the internet. Um, that's important. You can't hack into our system because you can't get there. Um, we also use multi-factor authentication now in our office, so we can't just sign in. Every time we sign in, we have to pull our phone or, or a token to confirm that we're who we say we are. Um, we have multiple firewalls. We do testing, intrusion, um, things like that, and um, are constantly monitoring our systems. Um, our facilities are secured by everyone has to have a badge with their picture on it. And then we also have a proximity card that only allows you into the areas that you have a business to be in, to work. So we really do limit, we limit access to our high security areas to just those people that need to be in there. So um, some of our primary process securities are that we always follow chain of custody and have two people with our ballots and our equipment. Um, we use a paper-based system. So even people that vote on our touch screens for accessibility, it spits out a piece of paper that you can put back in and it'll read back to you. So we always have the ballots. There's, there's no question about um, how someone could vote because we always have those ballots and we keep them for 22 months after the election, which allows plenty of time for there to be any challenges. Um, we conduct logic and accuracy testing of our equipment. We test it before we use it to make sure it's going to count correctly. And then after the election, we conduct a post-election audit to um, check it again to show that it did collect it, I mean, that it did count correctly. And then um, our ballots, you know, when, when a vote by mail ballot is, is submitted to us, you know, it has to be signed. It has to be signed and the signature needs to match the signature that we have on file for your voter registration. And yes, we check every single signature. We have eyes on, staff members do it, software doesn't do it. And, and we make sure that, that um, the person that signed that ballot is the person that was supposed to. Now, if you forget to sign your ballot or somehow something happens and it doesn't match, we'll reach out to our voters to try to uh, help them cure their signatures, the, the term. Um, so they can either come and sign it or provide a signature to us or um, say somebody's signatures changed dramatically, they can provide an updated signature. And then uh, securing our people, I've kind of already went over this, but we do background checks on all of our staff, including our temporary staff. And then you only have access to the places you have business being 
And we always have two people with our ballots and things like that. So um, anyway, I didn't read all the rest of that, but you can also see in the gray area in the bottom, some of the things that we have done to, um, through CISA to secure our systems. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna do a little bit of outreach and education. I just had to put this picture in there because we're still so proud of our trailer. Um, they're out often. Um, we hope to have them out for voter registration and also for um, people to drop their ballots off during the, um, during the time when the ballots have been sent. Uh, right now, um, our trailer's not out just because we didn't have a driver for it, but our, our crew is out. They are spending the next two weeks out at, I think, 14 different high schools doing voter registration and get out the vote for our youth. So um, pretty exciting. Okay, next slide. So this is just about our outreach. We're continuing to expand. We developed a strategic communication plan in 2020, which we're still working on. It's an evolving uh, program. And then we've got um, several things that we do out in the communities. We just had our, our quarterly election citizens engagement meeting on Monday. We invite the public, we invite our community-based organizations. Um, the League of Women Voters is always there. And we do, um, we discuss how things went, we discuss our plans, um, and we um, entertain any questions that the public has. So we would love to have anybody interested attend those meetings. And then I already talked about our, our drop off events. And um, I think Tommy's going to talk a little bit about our certified election observer program, which is something we started up for June. We're in our, our second cohort, and it seems to be um, very popular. And then um, our clerk recorder division does a lot of outreach and education as well. We do uh, records within reach, destination weddings, and then operation documentation, which is where we help veterans uh, record their DD-214s for free. So anyway, we continue to work with the community organizations. Um, I know right now the league is doing the candidate forums for November, the, yesterday, today, and tomorrow um, with our CCTV group. So next slide, please. All right, so now I'm gonna, going to turn it over to Tommy so he can talk a little bit about our coalition for Bay Area election officials. Great, thank you. Um, yes, you know, when I started here a little over a year ago and I started to watch, you know, the morning news, I was always thinking, you know, realizing that we share, uh, the Bay Area shares the entire media market, whether you're in Santa Clara or in Napa County or, you know, due east like Alameda County, that the news pretty much covers um, the entire Bay Area. And so I approached Debbie about, why don't we try to uh, get the uh, as many of the Bay Area counties that we can together so that we can uh, take advantage of this and leverage our resources as well as uh, our outreach to our voters. Um, the area uh, with regard to the 11 uh, Bay Area counties comprise of four point, and when you add up all of our registered voters, it's over 4.3 million voters. So, you know, that's a significant number of voters that we could be advocating to. Um, so we agreed to uh, join together and to um, provide, as we say, accurate, timely information about voting processes, really becoming transparent about exactly what we do and to advocate for ourselves as the trusted source of election information. In fact, we've been using the moniker as Bay Area Elections, B-A-E, as your Bay. If uh, anyone follows social media, especially the younger group, uh, the, you know, the younger voters, so to speak, they know what Bay means in that that's before anyone else or your significant other. And so we started to play with that to say, before anyone else, we're your Bay, and before anyone else come to us, with any questions about elections, uh, because we are dealing with uh, false and uh, mis and disinformation regarding the election, and you know there's uh, three different ways that you can define that, but it's all kind of information that distorts uh, things about the elections and makes people mistrust the election process. Um, in a lot of ways, it has to do with that we realize that the public really doesn't understand what we do during the election uh, process. And so they were victimized when there were, you know, kind of uh, 
uh, people uh, feeding them misinformation and telling them unfactual information about the election. So we need to do a better job of um, educating the voters. And it's much better to let them educating them beforehand rather than trying to debunk uh, misinformation after the fact, because then the information has already gone out there and has proliferated. And so we need to find a way to be ahead of the game uh, during during our election process. So next slide. So um, I should what well, we should just mention our award here. So I'm very, very proud to say that we submitted the coalition effort to the uh, National Association of Election Officials. They're known as the Election Center. And every year uh, submissions are made to uh, the organization and they're reviewed and they're selected uh, about eight uh, finalists were selected or eight awards were, were given. And I'm proud to say that the uh, coalition effort was given the Democracy Award. And the Democracy Award is that it's uh, slated as the best practice for 2022 across the nation. They really recognize, and this award goes to all 11 counties. It's not just Contra Costa, um, even though we, we did all of the work. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, we're very proud to say this because um, it really shows how counties who work together can really have a greater effect on our voters, especially in our neighboring counties. We recognize that counties that are smaller, especially that don't have any means of outreach can benefit from the coordinated effort that we have. So for instance, we, we have our website, bayareavotes.org, that's being hosted by Santa Clara County, or our largest county, our big sister of all of us here. Um, we've created fact sheets, uh, especially the, the larger counties worked on these fact sheets so that even the smaller counties can benefit from them. And we've heard that coming from the smaller county, the registrar saying, you know, they, it was so handy for them to have a fact sheet about a particular topic that they can refer to and, and provide answers to the public or to the media. And, um, we, and we have our Facebook page in order to, uh, you know, constantly broadcast our message. Um, this is a shift for us in the election world, I'd like to say, that, um, you know, it used to be that a successful election is one that we never make the news. Because if we made the news back in the day, it would be bad news because it was something that we made a mistake on or, you know, there was some something that we tripped up with and you know it's always negative news but we really have changed this in that we're embracing the media we find them as our partners in advocating for us and so it's really been a, a very positive uh, effort that we've been uh, making and so we're just we're just very proud of this uh, working through the Bay Area so next slide um, so yes the certified election observer program was an additional way in order to provide in-depth information and education to a select few number of, uh, of citizens who were interested in exactly what we do. And um, we, we tried it for the first time during the June election. We had uh, three members, uh, three people who went through the process. It's robust because we're actually having uh, these uh, observers in on three lengthy days. <laughs> they were there to watch us do our uh, logic and accuracy test and understand what was behind that. They took a tour of our facility. On another day, they observed our vote by mail processes and all we do was signature comparison, our equipment that we use uh, to um, scan our envelopes and to open our envelopes and uh, the sheer number of staff involved in uh, extracting those envelopes before being counted. Uh, that was a long day, actually. And we even showed them some of our in-person voting uh, operations on that same day. That's the Saturday right before Election Day. And then we had them in, actually, it was four days. We had them in during the canvas on two separate occasions to observe the processes that we do during the uh, to certify leading up to the certification of the election. I'm proud to say that two of our, our alumni uh, observers are, are part of our uh, panel here, and um, they can advocate and, and let you know what that experience was like. I think it was very educational for them to see 
uh, really the intricacies and, and all of the checks and balances that we go through leading to, you know, the confidence in the uh, results of the election. And so um, we're going to continue doing this. We thought it was very, very valuable. Um, I'm happy to say that we already had nine individuals showing interest in it. So that's three times as many uh, um, that we had originally, and we're just going to continue to uh, build on this. Uh, you may see the little passport that we uh, 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 created out of that. And the passport had all of the activities that we wanted the, the um, observer to, to observe. And um, so we use the passport as kind of like when you go travel around the world and you go to one country or another, you get stamps, you know, saying that you visited this country or that country. And so in this way, they were visiting this process or that process. And each of the uh, leaders of that process would then stamp that passport. And so it was to complete the journey of the uh, tour of the elections to um, lead to um, becoming certified as an election observer. And so we had this uh, little pin down at the bottom with the Uncle Sam hat there as the certified election observer pin. So you have to complete the program in order to receive the pin. We know pins are very popular, co-workers love them. So we created this pin as, as a very special one that uh, observers only can, can uh, receive. Uh, next page, next slide. Okay, thank you. Okay, back to me. Um, so this this is what we have ahead of us in the next in the next few months is um, of course the election. We we um, on November eighth, our certification deadline is December eighth. Um, we are going to try really really hard to have it done the Friday before. Um, that always gives us the weekend to kind of look at it one more time and and try to um, we always try to send ours into the Secretary of State the day before it's actually due. Um, then we'll be doing what, what we call re-precincting. So we've done redistricting. We had to do that before November, well, before June for the supervisorial and state and federal, and then for the November election for all of our local um, jurisdictions. Um, but because it was such a short amount of time, because the data came back from the census so late, um, we, we just did it quick and dirty. And we ended up with 1,300 different precincts, which is really kind of a hard to manage number. So now they'll be going back and looking at all those precincts and seeing where we can logically merge some of them and, and move some of the lines um, to get us down to about 1100, which is a very workable number for us. Um, then we're, we're gonna continue to um, innovate and evolve. Besides the coalition, which is keeping us busy, um, we were kind of talking amongst the, the county staffers, what's our next step? What are we gonna do? What are our next fact sheets? What are, what's another issue we should be taking on? Bay Area wide. And we're hoping we'll be um, working with the media more to for you to see us. You, you maybe see um, ads from us online or or um, presentations, you know, with the new with the news. Um, we were just recently selected as a Center for Election Excellence by the uh, US Alliance for Election Excellence. It's a group of nonprofit agencies um, for two reasons, I think. One is um, they have these nonprofits that can help you. Um, they can be resources for you. Say you um, wanna look into doing something a little differently or best practices, things like that. And also I think that they are using us as an example. Um, some of it has to do with, I think the coalition and things like that, where other agencies, other election agencies across the country may um, look to us to see how we're doing things. California historically has been on the forefront of election improvements and innovation and doing things like you know provisional ballots and sending everyone vote by mail. So um, I think that um, it says a lot. They're, they only selected, I think 15, is that right, Tommy? Um, across the whole country and only two were in California. So they're, they're actually coming tomorrow to meet with us. And then um, we're working with the election group, which is, is one of those nonprofits, but um, when Tommy and I were in uh, Denver for the national conference, um, we worked with the elections group on a, a, something about audits. Um, there are elections jurisdictions that don't audit their elections or they audit after they certify, which is crazy um, because we do all those things. And then 2023, 
is um, typically an off year, but we have a lot going on. We don't just um, stop working. So that's when we get a chance to review and update all of our policies and procedures. We work on staff training. We you know, do a lot of organizational stuff. And then we are already preparing for the 2024 elections. We're looking at um, our voting models and things that we do and how we can best um, carry any improvements into the 2024. And then, as you know, um, my term's up in early January and a new clerk recorder registrar will be elected in November. So um, we'll, we're planning a, you know, an orientation and gathering together resources and, and things like that. But it's going to be um, a, a busy, busy few months. So uh, next slide, I think we're just about done. Yes, so here is um, our current website. We hope within the next two to three weeks to be unveiling a new website. We're working on it. We have a, um, a, a new .gov designation, which is one more of our safety and security things to confirm that we're a government agency. And we'll be switching over to that when we have our, um, our new website up. So please, um, Feel free to take a screenshot or whatever. There are personal emails for our office, our titles. I've also put Helen on there. She's the assistant registrar who oversees the day-to-day -day operations. And then those are our social media sites. We have quite a few videos on YouTube now. And it's too bad we don't have it to share, but a really kind of funny uh, TikTok. <laughs> so um, that's it. I think the next slide says questions, but it's probably better to just leave that one up if you can so people can can get our information and then uh, there was a couple of questions someone asked a question about um, our other agencies modeling what we're doing with the coalition and to the best of our knowledge no but that is one of the reasons why we were invited to to present and why we won that award at the national conference um, because they're hoping that we could be a model for other other groups, particularly if you're in a, an urban area, we have several counties that are nearby each other that share the same media. So um, like I said, we gave that presentation and, and I think that's their hope that other counties will, will be able to share resources like this. Um, Look, let's Debbie, see. Debbie other... and Tom, Tommy, we so appreciate this in-depth look at the election process in Contra Costa County. And of course, as a certified election observer, Sean and I have nothing but great things to say about your wonderful program. So thank you so much. Next, we look at Voters Edge. Marion Chostrom began volunteering with the League Smart Voter in 2014. She has been a Contra Costa County Coordinator for Voters Edge since the League of Women Voters of California Education Fund began their partnership with Map MapLight in 2016 to create a unique website about candidates and ballot measures for California voters. Marion spent her career as an information specialist in a variety of settings, law school, high school, and community college. She holds a BA in history, an MA in library science, and a JD law. Marion, update Thank you, Martha. us. Thank you, Martha. And, um... Thank you all for including Voters Edge, which I think is a, um, a great tool to educate voters. Voters Edge is a partnership between MapLight and the League of Women Voters of California Education Fund. And many of you know that the League never endorses a candidate or a party, but the League may. Uh, advocate for um, subjects, for topics, issues, when they have studied an issue. And right now, um, this, this part of the league doesn't advocate. This is the part of the league that does voter education. It's a 501c3 um, part of the league. So I just want you to know about that difference between those units. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
Hmm. Sorry, I'm having a little difficulty <laughs> with this, getting okay. the next slide. Why don't you keep talking and I'll, I'll try to figure talking. out okay. <laughs> why I'm so, not doing so it. I'll, I'll, the next slide is about Voters Edge history. And it began as a pilot between um, Maplight and the leagues in California, New York, and Illinois in 2016. And right now, California is the only league that has continu continued that partnership. And uh, all other leagues use something called Vote 411. And the California State League believes that it is not as robust as Voters Edge. And um, so there are, um, okay. Sorry, I can get to this one. Okay. So I thought this would be good. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. So 36 counties in California participate in Voters Edge, which is not all counties. In order to part participate, you need to have someone willing to be the coordinator for that county. Um, next slide. So the front end of Voters Edge is what voters see and the back end is what the volunteers and the candidates see. Volunteers send invitations to candidates, they coordinate with the election office, they make sure all the data is accurate. Um, and then candidates submit information and they ag make agreements. And the um, volunteer, Voters Edge volunteers encourage candidates um, to participate and they add content as well. Next slide. So this is the entry screen for the Voters Edge website. And the red part, um, the red arrow points to where you would enter your street address and your zip code and you would get your ballot, everything that is on your ballot. The blue arrow points to other things that you can find out from Voters Edge. You can look up ballots by county using a pull down menu. So if you wanted to see all of the Contra Costa County candidates, you would use the pull down menu to view Contra Costa County. There's also an election archive. You can see a list of all the past elections since 2016, both the primaries and the general elections. Next slide. So what do candidates agree to? Um, can it, we don't have a lot of rules for Voters Edge, but candidates may not use bad language. They may not mention an opponent by name or by title. And they can't say things like, I'm the only candidate who would. And the reason they can't do that is because there's no way to verify. It. I'm the only candidate who wears blue. Um, so for candidate photos, uh, the, the candidate photos have to be a headshot of the candidate, candidate alone. In the past, we've had candidates who put up um, shots of themselves with their cute pets or their family. And we just um, want the candidate to be talking to the voter about themselves. And the, um, the photograph can't be more than two years old. So on the, on the right of, um, you see what candidates agree to. And I don't know if you can see this, um, but candidates agree, they check a box and they say that they will not make in any way a reference to another candidate or to another candidate's qualifications, character, or activities. They also verify that they won't say anything that is false, slanderous, or libelous, and they accept the responsibility for the truth and accuracy of the content to Voters Edge. Next slide. So what do candidates post? They're required to post their profession and their top three priorities. In addition, they can post a lot of other information like photos, biographical experience, qualifications, 
position papers. Um, and volunteers review all of the submissions to make sure that they don't use bad language or mention another candidate or say I'm the only candidate. Um, the volunteers do not correct spelling or grammar. Um, the league motto is let the voters decide. And volunteers also do not um, have to view all the videos uh, because when a candidate puts up a video, they verify that everything in the video is true. And um, we also don't uh, check their endorsements because if they put up an endorsement that someone didn't do, they'll hear about it from that person. Next slide. So MapLight provides financial information for state and federal candidates and for state measures. This is an example of financial information for the current um, governor, governor's race. And it, MapLight tells you how much money has been raised and who has been uh, the chief contra contributors to the governor's race for both of these candidates. Next slide. So why do voters use Voters Edge? They can compare all candidates in one place instead of looking at many different websites. They can decide which candidates they wanna learn more about and go to that candidates website or social media. And I think one of the things that candidate that voters really like is that they don't see any negative campaigning on Voters Edge. Candidates talk about their own candidacy, candidacy not their opponents. And um, I think people also, voters also appreciate that candidates put things that are true on Voters Edge. Next slide. So um, we also add content to Voters Edge when we can. And this is an example of some added content that was added to the DA race in or the DA contest in the primary. And um, we add news articles, but only if they talk about all candidates. We add events such as upcoming candidate forums. And uh, we add videos that include all of the candidates. And this is an example of the, the sheriff and DA um, special justice forum that was held during the, the primary. Next slide. So one of the best things about Voters Edge, I think, is that it's a way that you can learn about down ballot candidates. It's pretty easy to find out information about presidential um, and state, uh, national and statewide candidates, but to find out information about mayors, city councils, school districts, and special districts is much more challenging, partly because most of those candidates don't have big budgets. And this is a way for candidates to put up information, every candidate gets a free profile on Voters Edge. And currently um, in our county, there are more than a hundred contests and almost 300 candidates that voters need to learn about. And I think one of the reasons we have so many active candidates in this county is because the elections department has done a lot of innovative outreach to um, encourage candidates and to educate them about what is required for them to run. So um, kudos to the elections department. Next slide. So um, Voters Edge also has information about measures. In addition to candidates, you can find out about measures. And if you look at the slide, there are tabs across the top, one for candidates, one for measures, voting information, and my choices. So for state measures, um, 
And this is Proposition 31, yes or no, banning flavored tobacco products. Um, for state measures, they tell you what yes means, they tell you what no means. And there's a um, the easy voter guide, which is a, a brief summary for, for busy voters if they don't wanna really get in the weeds about a proposition. It gives you um, brief, a summary of what it's about and pros and cons. If you wanna get into the weeds, you can go into the pros and cons, which has much more detailed information about each prop proposition. And then there's also links at the bottom to websites for people who are supporting a proposition and people who are opposing a proposition. Next slide. For local measures, we, um, we put up information when we find it, such as an impartial analysis of a local measure. This is, this is the city of Richmond measure P that's gonna be on the November ballot. Um, so there's a link to the impartial analysis. There are arguments pro and con, and you can actually read the legislation um, if you really want, uh, want more detail. Next slide. So just to reiterate, this is the Voters Edge entry page. When you um, type in votersedge.org, this is what you get. And um, you can find your ballot, but on the right in that box, you can see that you can also get, um, you can learn when, and where, when, and how to vote. You can keep track of your choices and use them to vote. You can check to see when your ballot was mailed, received, or counted, and um, uh, track your ballot. You will also always see, do you wanna donate to Voter's Edge? And that's because it's not a moneymaker. Um, it's an educational tool so that voters can be informed. And um, so of course the league welcomes contributions, but you're free to use this without making a contribution. So um, questions? Well, Marion, I think we'll wait till the end for questions, but we wanna thank you for your efforts to, to provide voters with the crucial information they need to choose a candidate that best reflects their interests. And of course, the pros and the cons of the ballot measures, again, to best reflect their interests. Uh, next, so, we're going to. So, can I just answer the question? How do you oh, access Voter Edge? Um, just type in your browser, votersedge.org, and you will get there. Oh, thank you. And I do that often, and I compare candidates often, and so appreciate your efforts. Next, we're going to hear from an elected official who will fill us in on the importance of voting in down ballot contests that affect our lives every day. Now, we're going to hear from uh, Maureen Toms, who is a Pinole City Council member. Before her service on the City Council, she was a community volunteer in several areas, including the Pinole Planning Commission, the Citizens Bond Oversight Board for West Contra Costa Unified School District, a parent volunteer in local schools, Pinole Seals Swim Team, and Pinole Hercules Little League Challenger Division. She is currently a swim coach for the local Special Olympics team. Maureen holds a BS degree in Geography Environmental Studies and has been a land use planner for county government for more than 31 years. Her work on land use issues such as economic development, transit oriented development, affordable housing, infrastructure financing, and emergency operations are easily transferred to the city of Pinole operations. Maureen is a lifelong Pinole resident and she and her husband raised their three children in Pinole. Uh, Maureen, please begin. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Martha. I wanted to also take a moment to thank the League of Women Voters and the dedicated staff of the Contra Costa Library and CCTV for broadcasting this event. The city of Pinole is a subdivision of the state. It operates under a county, excuse me, a council manager form of municipal government. 
The city council is comprised of five members, all elected at large to four year terms. I mentioned the at large because some cities and other jurisdictions have district elections where the council members or representatives come from different geographical areas of the city or the jurisdiction. The council seats are nonpartisan and Pinole City Council has three direct employees. Those include the city manager, the city clerk, and the city attorney. Uh, the council is the legislative branch of city government and the city manager oversees the administrative branch. Pinole is a full service city, meaning it provides police services, fire services, recreation, building and planning, and we also operate a sewage treatment plant. Um, these are areas that are within the city's purview. Our purview includes the annual budget for those services, approving plans such as the capital improvement plan, which is also um, sets our priorities for capital infrastructure investment uh, like roads, sidewalks, bike lanes, parks, uh, improvements to city owned uh, facilities and such. The council also has the authority to adopt ordinances, either um, ordinances that are required from state legislation or to implement policy. An example um, would be uh, adopting an ordinance uh, to restrict polystyrene um, uh, products within um, the city. Another example would be that um, you know, some cities are adopting electrification ordinances, which mean that all new construction would have to be electric only. Uh, there are some jurisdictions that um, uh, adopt those ordinances that uh, exempt restaurants, for instance. So that's all very local um, I, you know, issues that the city deals with. Um, we adopt other plans, such as the general plan, specific plans. We have a strategic plan. And to make sure that those plans don't just sit on the shelf, we also work with our administrative division, uh, part of the government, to implement those plans. Um, the implementation might include a to-do list, and we would include those in the budget um, because you, we're not going to be able to afford to do everything at once. So we we will prioritize and budget accordingly, so that you know we might have measures that need to be implemented in year one and two, and then um, you know year three and to five and then longer term um, implementation measures. In many cases, um, we are part of joint powers authorities. And that's really because as the city of Pinole alone or the city of Richmond alone or the city of Hercules and so on within our region are better working together on some issues. And an example here would be that um, Westcat, Westcat, our local transportation um, provider, our bus service. Uh, we're, we have a joint powers authority with uh, Pinole, Hercules, and unincorporated county to provide bus services. And um, so as part of that, yeah. our council appoints members to be part of that, those boards. We are also part of a joint powers authority for our clean um, clean energy. Um, we are we belong to um, Marin Clean Energy, as do uh, does the unincorporated county, and many cities in Contra Costa County. And we have members uh, of the city council that also sit on that board as well. Um, for instance, we, we also have um, Recycle More. We have goals in which to uh, divert garbage from the landfill. 
Um, this is a state mandate that dates back to uh, the late 1980s. And it's better if we work with uh, other jurisdictions to make that happen. So we have our council member Tave sits on the Recycle More board um, to take care of that. All of these boards have alternates so that we make sure that our city is represented here on these issues. Now, the services that we don't provide and that are provided by others, those include um, the K-12 schools, the community college, regional parks, um, uh, electricity, and many more. Um, however, we do work very closely with um, those that provide those services. As council members, we receive a lot of comments regarding um, services. And even though we don't directly, um, it's not directly within our purview, we do work closely with the representatives um, that do oversee um, those services, like school districts or uh, park districts. Um, we have a close relationship with our um, elected representatives, um, you know, through the state assembly, the U.S. Congress and Senate, uh, either directly or through their dedicated staff. I wanted to also bring up, we talked about uh, earlier about down ballots. Um, you know, some of the services that are provided uh, in cities and in unincorporated areas are provided through special districts. Um, and those also have elected boards. Uh, these are really important services and it's important that people pay attention to those elections that are down ballot. Um, they will include, this is just an example, um, Ambrose Recreation and Park District. They handle uh, park services in the unincorporated area of Bay Point and also part of Pittsburgh. Pleasant Hill Recreation and Park District. Um, and then there's water districts. Um, East Bay Mud has a, an elected board, as does Contra Costa Water District. Uh, your school districts, your local school districts, plus there's the community college district, which is a countywide um, for our um, community colleges. And then there's the Office of Education, which is also covers the entire county. Um, the, the latter, they include district elections. So um, for where I live in West Contra Costa, we're gonna have a different representative uh, that we elect to those, um, to those boards than say somebody in East County or in Central County. Also, um, one of the larger districts is the um, Bay Area Rapid Transit District. Uh, that covers uh, several counties in the Bay Area. And um, I think Contra Costa County has part of uh, three areas um, I hope I'm right on that number, but um, we have um, three BART board members uh, that cover different geographic areas that are also included uh, in the election, in elections. So um, if I were to give my recommendation to somebody who's thinking about running for office, um, any of these offices, if they have um, an interest in community service, that's um, you know, number one. They are the liaison between the citizens, uh, the residents, um, whether they're property owners or renters. Uh, a, a lot of times there's employees that live outside of the city. Um, they may have some concerns that um, you know, they convey to their electeds. Um, we want to have, you know, somebody who's interested in um, directing, you know, having an influence on how policy is directed, um, improving the budgets, approving a budget, um, 
making sure that priorities are met, um, adopting ordinances, implementing plans, that sort of thing. You might have um, uh, somebody who is, uh, you know, puts on their priorities that they want to have more bike lanes. And you might have another candidate who, um, you know, that's not their highest priority. So those are the kinds of things that people, that candidates will put into their voter edge profiles so that a voter can decide which way they want to cast their votes. Now in Penol, we have seven candidates that are up in November or that will be um, uh, up for consideration in November for three open seats. Uh, and again, Voters Edge is an excellent source for getting information on each of those candidates, um, not only in the city of Pinal, but in all of the special districts that um, were mentioned um, earlier. So that's what I have for now, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, oh, Maureen, thank you, because this is the time for questions. So if all of our panelists would turn on their um, their video and their microphones again, we'll, we'll go to questions. And if you have a question, please uh, enter it in your chat. And I think there was a question that I don't see anymore about Voters Edge and how many people are participating. So I'm going to ask Marion to kick it off with how participation is in Voters Edge. So um, during the primary, 85% of the candidates in our county participated in Voters Edge. Um, we are usually, our county usually has um, more candidates than almost every other county. Um, and I think that's partly because of the, all the publicity that a lot of organizations in the elections department and the CCTV give to Voters Edge. Um, candidates are currently posting their information. They just received their invites uh, around September 5th or 6th. And so they have time to, to post their, uh, their profiles. So there's another question and that is, is Voters Edge in other languages or just English? Um, there is a little information in Spanish, but, um, but, but essentially that's really a problem for all of the, you know, there's, there's not information in multiple languages in Voters Edge. But Debbie and Tommy can tell us about ballots and languages that are available. So as part of um, our, the huge increase in vote by mail, we um, made the decision to change from a trilingual ballot of Spanish and Chinese back to bilingual ballots. So we do English Spanish and we do English Chinese. And then of course at all of our polling places and early voting sites, um, we have, I think it's seven other languages um, available on either the touch screen or we have a master book that has all the languages in there that you can go through to, we call it our, um, it's, uh, we call it the big, big, big voter information guide. And it has the translations of the, of, of the information and then also ballots, facsimile ballots in all the other um, languages as well. So some of the questions are going by too fast for me to answer. Um, one of them was about curing a ballot. What does it mean? I see do that. Do so curing the curing your ballot is when we receive a ballot that either the signature doesn't match the one we have on file or it's missing. Um, someone just simply forgot to sign their ballot. Um, happens sometimes that a husband and wife sign each other's ballots by mistake, and we have to kick those out because you know if we find them both and can line them up, but you know there's a half a million ballots sometimes that come back to us. So we will reach out to the voters. So it's important that we have your email, your phone number, and we'll notify you or we'll send a letter if it's not too close to the certification date. We'll actually reach out to have you either come in and sign your ballot or, pro and, or provide an updated signature if your signature has changed dramatically. Um, a lot of times um, it's usually the 
miss signature. That's usually so the curing is just the the process that we use to fix those. So another one is what triggers a recount and how is it handled? So Tommy, you want to answer this? Well, sure. Um, there is actually nothing that triggers a recount yeah. in terms First of uh, uh, election here. Um, now, I will say probably about uh, 10 to a dozen years ago, there were some Secretary of State regulations that did trigger uh, a recount when a contest was so close. And this was a statewide contest uh, that was happening. And I remember my neighboring county from when I was in um, along the Central Coast had to go through that type of elevated uh, um, uh, recount that was mandated, but then those uh, those uh, were sunsetted, and we haven't seen any more action in that way. So, in terms of a recount, it's certainly at a registered voter. Typically, it's the campaign or the candidate when there's a close race that they will want to have a recount, and it's a daily. There's a daily rate assigned to it, and they can determine like what order of the ballots to be recounted, whether they're vote by mail or in person. For them to do, I will say from a internal standpoint, you know, if we had a fairly close race, we would probably elevate our uh, number of ballots that we uh, uh, that we check against. So instead of one percent, we might elevate it to two or five percent. Uh, we might check as more of the polling place ballots, the the polls that had those ballots. Uh, being cast for that particular contest elevated so that we could do a thorough check of that and just have even believe more in the confidence of our results when we certify the election. Thank you. And how are nonprofits involved with elections? What groups besides the League of Women Voters? Um, I typed something into um, the chat or the Q&A. Um, so we work with a lot of different nonprofits and community-based organizations. Um, our, our outreach and education group kind of takes the lead on that. The best example I had was in um, for November 2020, we received a grant that we were able to use and we were able to um, provide some funding to about 25 community organizations, we call them CBOs, community-based organizations, to help us with get out the vote and registration and things like that. And we worked with, you know, I'm just off, I know we worked with the league, we work with people like, or groups like the Monument Crisis Center, um, the RISE Center out in Richmond or San Pablo. Um, and they were community-based organizations that then helped to um, reach out to people in their neighborhoods or, or their demographics. Um, we also reach out to those same groups to try to find like poll workers because voters like to, um, go to a poll where their people from their community are working and they speak their language and things like that. So I don't I don't have the list right in front of me, but we are always interested in any community organizations that want to help us with our as long as they remain, you know, nonpartisan to help us with our outreach and education and getting them the messages out to to folks. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but um, I also see um, Diane Bianchi. You know, what must voters do to ensure their ballot is counted? You know, make sure you're registered first. Make sure you're registered at the correct address. Next, um, make sure we have an updated signature on file. And if all of those things are, then um, vote your ballot and send it back to us as soon as you can. Because if you wait too long, and we, we don't accept ballots for other, we accept them for seven days at, as long as they're postmarked on election day. So um, those are the easiest things I would say to assure that, that your vote gets counted. And then we want Marion to answer about Voters Edge and Easy Voter Guide. So um, Voters Edge gives information about candidates and measures. The Easy Voter Guide only gives information about state propositions, state measures. And someone else asked about um, uh, the fact that some candidates aren't on Voters Edge, and it's up. We can't force anyone to put their their information up. We encourage them, and you can encourage candidates in your area to put information on Voters Edge. I've had um, people tell me that they tell candidates uh, that they're not going to vote for them unless they post their information on Voters Edge. 
So there's a, a, a link for you to click on Voters Edge to encourage a candidate to post a profile. So please do that. So I, I see another question here about if a voter encounters intimidation by another person or group at a voting site, what should, who should they report that to? And, and there are, there's always, you know, multiple clerks and an inspector there. Um, they should go to the inspector who is the head of the polling place. And then we also have roving inspectors and those people have access and a direct line to our command center here in the office all day long. So if anything like that happens and they call us, um, we don't want our, our poll workers to feel threatened. So we'll take the responsibility of, of calling the police if that's what it takes. But um, you know, there's all the, everybody that works in one of our polls in, is trained in what to do if this kind of a thing happens. So I would just say that a, a voter should go to one of the poll workers and let them know if there's something that they don't feel comfortable with. And then um, what is the best source to counter information? Well, that's the mantra of our coalition, which is to go to your local elections official. Our staff are happy to answer any questions all the time if they are not sure of something. You know, we post things on our website. You know, we have things on our social media, but if you have a question, come to us and ask us. We'll let you know or give you the correct information. So one of the other questions I missed was, can you please confirm how many were purged from the voter rolls due to deaths are people relocating since the 2020 election? Yes, and my, I had said I was trying to get that and my staff just got me the data. So um, just so you know, I didn't, um, they didn't give it to me all the way back through 2022, but from June of this year till September 15th of this year, uh, they moved to inactive 1,923 people who showed up on the state death records, 57 people who moved out of the county, 3,733 people that uh, were moved to an active because they were um, moved out of state. That came through, um, I think, the post office. So we've sent address confirmations to all those people. And the last was um, undeliverable, 8,400 people, wow. uh, voters, their ballots were undeliverable. We, we buy, get that information back from the U.S. Postal Service and then use it to... Um, use it to make these determinations, but we, we just make them inactive. We don't delete them out of our system. So if, if there was some sort of a mistake, we send them an address confirmation postcard. And if they call us and say, hey, I didn't move, you know, somebody wrote moved on my ballot and sent it back to you, then we'll reactivate them. And then uh, there is a comment, Voters Edge is updated daily. Marion posted that for everyone to, to see. Do we have any other questions that I might have missed? I was wondering about people who have moved from another state here. Uh, how do you get them not registered in their old state? We, we don't have the ability to do that right now. There is um, a national organization that's called ERIC, and um, Tommy probably knows what ERIC stands for, but it's a, a federal, federal level master database and um con or california does not participate in that right now but tell me you have anything you'd like to add you, i know you have know more about that too well it it interfaces um i think probably 37 states are participating in it right now including all of the states that surround california and it provides you know out of state information it does synchronize like the dmvs for example it synchronizes the death records, you know, should someone move out of the state, pass away in the state, we don't receive those death certificates automatically. So that's where uh, um, I think, and I think it's called uh, ele uh, ele Electronic Registration Information Center. There you go. They will be able to bring that, call that information together and distribute it to the counties um, that way. And so we see it as a really good thing. It's the next level up that could really help us be able to receive that interest state information to further um, you know, uh, update our, our voter rolls. Uh, and we're looking for something like that in the future. Maybe we can get there in, in a year or two, uh, but it'll take, the, it'll take a state effort to make that happen. Thank you. Maureen, as an elected, what information would you give someone who is thinking of running for in office? 
Sure, I would, um, of course, they would need to uh, talk to our city clerk uh, first. Um, there's a booklet that the city clerk provides and they work very closely with the elections office. Um, but they need to learn what the rules are for elections. There's um, you know, some very important rules as far as where you can place signs, how soon you can place signs. Um, can you include a city seal in your campaign material? Um, the answer is no. Um, can you uh, put signs up on the freeway or on the on-ramps? Um, you know, there's a number of rules that are meant to level the playing field and make it make sure that, um, you know, everybody's on equal footing. If there's, um, you know, people have to sign up uh, for a campaign, uh, FPPC, the Fair P Political Practices Commission web um, uh, uh, number. And um, so all of their campaign material has to refer to what their number is. Um, you, have their, you have to be really careful about taking donations and your expenditures, and you have to report them. So um, rules like that, that's just getting through the election cycle. And then of course, there's always, you have to have a passion to do the work and the time because it does take a lot of time. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few minutes left for questions. And the last one that I've received is what are the groups represented here doing on National Voter Registration Day, September 20th? Well, in Contra Costa County, our elections division usually sets up a table downstairs and we have a frame for people to take selfies with and we hand out some bling. Um, I know that we have uh, people, our um, outreach and education group are out at the schools and I'm trying to see if they're, they're actually gonna be at Mount Diablo and Concord um, for that day. Um, visiting with youth, trying to pre-register some people and things like that. Uh, we have a board meeting and we have some items on our board meeting that we'll be attending. And, and I think we might just do a little, um, a little, uh, what would you call it? Public information, sign up, just like one of the regular people to remind folks that it's voter registration. We didn't do a big formal thing this year. Um, we did a last year or the year before where we went before the board and did a presentation. How about you guys? Well, Sean is our voter registration guru. And Sean, do you want to come on and answer? Well, I'm not sure I'm a guru, but <laughs> I do know that um, the hopefully the outreach trailer will be in operation. Um, but I'm scheduled to be with uh, Don Kruger at LMC on National Voter Registration Day. So, um, you know. That's awesome. On my schedule, it says pending Dawn at LMC. So I could check that off. <laughs> You'll yeah. be there. Yeah, so um, last year we did a number of, uh, we, we were out there last year in a number of the different libraries, Lafayette, Clayton, Antioch. Um, but this year, the I spoke to one of the librarians and they felt that people are doing more of their registration, um, you know, either using a QR code or they're doing it more digitally, basically, so that they didn't feel compelled to be tabling when not many people were taking advantage of it at that, at that time. So I have not heard from any librarians this year to be able to man them. But, um, you know, between now and the latter part of the month, there are a number of presentations that are being, being given because we've been invited to Carondelet and uh, to St. Mary's College. So, you know, we're, it's an ongoing thing rather than just really a lot of energy on one day. Well, thank you. So really quickly, when is the poll workers training because someone was approved to be a poll worker? I'm just bringing up the schedule. It starts, online training starts December, December, October 10th. And 
it goes, I mean, I have three pages of various, where does the person live? Because we have training in Antioch and Concord, Richmond, and it continues all the way through 1028. We have three pages of different training locations. Wow. I would assume that if you have been notified you're a poll worker, you will be receiving this information. Oh, I'm sure they will. And one really, really quick final one. We've seen some questionable access to voting machines in other states. How do we ensure that our systems are protected from bad behavior? Well, one of the things is our move back to central count that takes 152 voting machines out of the precincts that could be, you know, touched or something could happen to them and it retains the control of that process in our office. Um, we use the Dominion system and time and again, um, the results come back that those machines count accurately. There's actually, there is no report out of hundreds and hundreds of reports of there being problem problems, there is still absolutely no proof that they're that they don't do anything but count ballots accurately. And right. we do our logic and accuracy beforehand, and we do our post election audits after to confirm that they they work correctly. Well, thank you all so very much, and we will go to our closing comments. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters of West Contra Costa County, the Contra Costa County Library and CCTV, I want to extend a genuine thank you to each of our panelists for being here today to offer such an informative and timely conversation about your roadmap to voting 2022. I want to thank Debbie Cooper, Tommy Gong, Marion Shostrom, and Maureen Toms. And especially thank you to our Spanish interpreter, Pamela Perales. Uh, we will be rebroadcasting um, these programs at these times and dates on CCTV. And can we go to the next slide? I seem to have lost the page that goes with it. Oh, the YouTube links. Your presentation will be available for viewing on the YouTube channels of the League of Women Voters, Diablo Valley, and the Contra Costa Library, as you can see listed here. And the next slide. These are useful links for voting in the November 8th, 2022 election. Please take a minute to keep looking at these and jot them down quickly and they will be available. Save the date for the next community conversation and get the low time down on the 2022 propositions. There'll be an extensive pros and cons of these propositions that you will be um, viewing. That's this Thursday, October 13th, at 4 p.m. And finally, Community Conversations is brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters of West Contra Costa County, the Contra Costa County Library, and CCTV. Join the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. The League never endorses or opposes candidates or political parties. We influence public policy through education and advocacy, and we invite men and women to join us. Thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful in-depth look at voting with this Map to Voting 2022. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.